Um, so we sh we are in Acts chapter one. What we've seen up to this point is Jesus ascended into heaven, and as a part of that ascension, there was this promise that He would send the Holy Spirit that would give them power, power to accomplish the ministry, power to accomplish it, the purposes and the plans that that He has set before um, the church as a whole. Uh, the, the the apostles. Um, are going to be now sent out into the world to go make disciples. Um, but they're going to have to sit tight. They're going to have to wait until the power has been given, which we know is on the day of Pentecost. And we'll talk through that next uh, next week. But while they're waiting, okay, while they're in that place of waiting, um, we're going to find that they have to make a decision, uh, that there's a responsibility to make a decision that comes before them and we're going to get to see an incredible pattern on how are we able to know or be able to make decisions based on you know, God's will. Um, as a church, as an individual, um, I'm assuming that here uh, some of you guys might have a big decision coming up. Um, or you regularly have to make decisions in some way, shape, or form. We're going to get to see a model for that. We're going to be able to see um, a model for us to be able to understand to be able to discern um, the will of God and be able to make a decision um, that would honor the Lord and that would allow us to be able to uh, you know fulfill the things that God has set before us so so here we are verse 12 it says this then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day journey. Uh, so when Jesus ascended into heaven, it was right there on the Mount of Olives, just outside of Jerusalem. When they say a Sabbath day journey, it's just a short walk, okay? And what we see here is, is the very last thing Jesus told them to do was go to Jerusalem and wait. So we see this understanding that when Jesus told them to do something, what did they do? They simply were obedient, right? That the foundation of the direction that they were going had to start with being obedient. And together, they were all moving in the same direction. And interestingly, it says that, um, and when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with the women and the, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers, right? So as they go in, they go into the upper room. And interestingly, that upper room very likely was the same upper room which Jesus had taken the Last Supper, right? The idea there in the original language is the upper room, which has only been referred to one other time prior to, which was there when Jesus was having that Last Supper. So a very intimate setting intimate place they were there and they were focused um, on prayer and who do we have we got all the disciples minus one that would be judas right so we got 11 disciples we also see that everybody that was following jesus at the at the time primarily we see the women which are a part of this group which was surprising in that day that the women would have been a part and attached to this kind of a prayer group at this time of of, of gathering together because there was such a division um, there really was um, a major issue between the different genders at, during that time, and Jesus broke down the wall. He had no problem having women come alongside, minister alongside of him, to him, that whole thing. And so, I mean, if you look at kind of the, the women's liberation movement that has gone way extreme, we can see that, well, frankly, Jesus was the one who opened the door for women to have some serious rights. And in every culture where you've seen the gospel be able to impact, you get to see the rights of women be able to, to increase because there's, there, we're equivalent in our capacity to be able to do ministry. There may be different roles that are unique for a man and a woman, but he seems we get that, that coming together. But what did they do? Right? They, they, they first they obeyed, and then we get to see that they were unified. Right, that they came together in one accord, that there was a general unity, which is one of those things that as a church that we live in today, guys, is so missed. Right? There is so 
little unity between church and church and church. There's always these little divisions, these little dividing lines. But early on in that early church, there was one focus. There was one mission. And that's to be able to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out. And as they came together, there wasn't a bunch of infighting. I mean, well, maybe we should pray for that. Maybe we should pray for this. Why are we sitting here in this stupid room? All, that wasn't happening. Right? They were earnestly seeking and waiting for the very next thing that Jesus had promised to them, which shows us a tremendous amount of power as we're going to make decisions. Right? With our marriage, it's one thing to say, man lead, right? And then the man chooses to make every single decision all the way, regardless of what the wife thinks. Actually, it says that we're to be submitted to one another. Right? That there is a leadership in position, but there's a mutual submission to one another, which actually means a measure of unity. Right? That as we're making decisions for our home, for our family, of how we raise our kids, of, of all those sorts of things, that there's a necessity to come together. Right? That one doesn't override the other and, and all those things, unless there is legitimately um, direction where we, you have no other choice but to go, and the husband is leading in a direction that wouldn't be considered sin, but feels very strongly with it. And then the wives, you have the opportunity and blessing to just trust the leadership of your husband. But there's so much of a blessing when you're able to be unified together, that you seek that unity. Um, and same thing with the church. Unity is, is the very thing that the Lord prayed for, for us and for his disciples, is that we would be unified for one purpose, right? What's the vision? What have we been really getting focused on? Just one more. Just one more transformed by Jesus. Right? That's got to be our focus. Because what happens when, you know what, we just don't like what goes on on the stage when we come in on a Wednesday and somebody says, well, maybe we should just move all the stuff. And another person says, well, let's just sit at tables. Another person says, well, why do we need tables? We can just do a circle and we can do all this sort of stuff. And you can get all these little opinions on Things that really don't matter. How about we just get focused on how do we get one more person to be able to hear the truth of God's word? How can we allow for some environment to take place, some situation to happen so that the gospel can be preached? Right? When we're so caught up in all of the minutia of church, of life, of all these problems, we find ourselves nitpicking. And all these things. And the reality of it is, guys, as you look at the way that we view the Bible and we view the call that we have as believers, is that we're supposed to give of our lives just as Christ gave of, gave of his life for us on our behalf. And that's a call that you're going to hear week after week after week. If I'm going to say just one more, that means that I might go through hell and back for the sake of one person being able to experience the transforming power of Jesus Christ, right? I'm going to be willing to go through that. So therefore, when you're encouraged and exhorted to be able to walk out your faith in a way that stretches you beyond your capacity, well, that's kind of the expectation. I don't think there's anything that we teach here that's truly radical in comparison to what Christ's call really was. It may be radical from pick your church down the street, but it's not radical. It's not that far off. And if we're focused on the fact that, you know what, we come in on a Sunday, we want one person to hear the gospel. We want one person in this place to understand the power and the transformation that can happen with the life submitted to Jesus Christ. We want one kid in the kids ministry to have that same sort of experience. We want our marriages to be transformed by Jesus. And we want all of the heartache, all of the stress, all of the nitpicking, all of the thoughts. and all, They go out the window, don't they? If we're unified for one reason, and we stay focused on being unified for that reason, just one more person. It means that whenever we do an outreach and we look around, it's like, wow, we are all exhausted and tired, and this has been a lot of work. Maybe there was just one conversation that could have impacted one person for eternity. Don't you wish a group of people would do that for your kid? Absolutely. Don't you wish that somebody would take that amount of effort for somebody you love? Then we ourselves are called to do that thing. And that's why we, that's how we stay unified. 
We understand that there is one reason why we as followers of Christ have been gathered together as River Rocks Church, and that's so one person might just know. Whatever that looks like, and that's got to be the heart. And so that's what they were doing. They were of one accord. And what were they doing in that upper room? They were praying. They were, they were seeking God's will. There was a desire to understand the heart of God for what's going to be the next season. What's going to be the next direction? What are they going to ultimately do? Right? So you can see, first of all, they obeyed. Second of all, they sought to be unified together. And then third, they were praying. They were, they were actually seeking God's will collectively so that the vision of what's going to be next is going to be known. And so that measure of prayer is the foundation of every step of faith that we might ever be able to take. Whether it's in your home and you have an opportunity to pray together with your spouse as God is leading you down a direction that feels way over your head. You know, whether it's you know here in the church as we're you know considering and praying through different things like the building that's coming up potentially. Like there has to be a genuine desire and a heart to be able to seek and understand the will of God individually and corporately. You know, this is really cool. Actually, this week I was I had some extra time and I went downtown and I, I walked around the building seven times praying just over the building. God, if it's your will, may you just miraculous do something miraculous for us to be able to, to have this space. If this is what you want to do. And as I was praying, praying over the prison, praying over the courthouse, praying over the bank, praying over, you know, the, the old man that was sitting there at the bank letting people in, right? You get to see good sins. And, you know, it's like, you know, everybody who's been in this community for a thousand years happens to go into that building. And, and you get to see all these individuals. I mean, I saw more people in like, you know, walk around that, walk around that building one time than I think ever drive down this driveway. But there's this. What is, what is the goal? We want one person to know. And one thing we've been praying in this church since I've been here, where are the hurting people? Where are they at? Like, how do we actually know that the person that's next door to you is hurting? Well, maybe you get to know them, but we would never know that. But downtown, you've got families that are broken, walk into that courthouse every single day. You've got people that have been totally strung out in drugs, made stupid decisions, and family members that are impacted and destroyed in that area. Right? There's that's what hurting people live. Right? And so it just stirs up a, a vision, but we got to make sure that God is collectively in that, corporately, that we are moving in a direction that He desires. And so there's that measure of us coming together, unified. Praying for God to open or close doors, right? Laying things out before him so that he's the one that ultimately makes the decision. And then we look here, verse 15, here's the issue. Here's what they're praying about. Here's what's been brought up before them. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120, okay? Large group of people that are up there and they're, they're praying and said, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained heart in this ministry. Now with this man, now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, uh, and all of his entrails gushed out, and it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that the field is called in their own language Ekeldama, which is the field of blood. Okay, so we get this situation where as they're praying. Peter steps up as a leader and actually doesn't put his foot in his mouth, which was surprising, which shows you a legitimate change in his life from like, you know, what he thinks prior, whatever. 
like a legitimate change. He's now a leader. We also see him pulling back or pulling up scripture as a basis of making his decision. Right? He, he made it crystal clear that, that just as David had predicted, well, in Psalms 41, 9, it said, even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who I ate my bread, had lifted up his heel against me. Psalm, uh, David was likely talking about one of his enemies that was very close to him that had ultimately betrayed him and gone against him. But it's also a foreshadow of the very thing that happened to Jesus. And Peter happened to pick that out as the incredible clarity that a prediction of this would happen with Judas. So he's digging into the word of God, realizing that we've got to make a decision. Right? And you got this interesting section here where, where we get to see that you know Judas, after he bought or, he, or he, was, he was bought for 30 pieces of silver, took that and went and bought a field with that money because he, for whatever reason he bought the field. That was part of what God had predicted in Scripture. And you, know, you get this really incredible visual. We know he hung himself, but for whatever reason, whether he was hanging there and then his body fell off after it was bloated and exploded when it hit the ground, I mean, you have no idea why that's, you know, it's, but you get this sense that a tragic situation happened, and now there has to be something that's fixed about this. What is it? They got to replace him. They got to find somebody to be able to fill the shoes of Judas, who had taken part of the ministry for three years, that walked with Jesus for a long period of time. And ladies, you guys got to learn all about this in the women's Bible study of the weight and the intensity and how you can even imagine what it would have been like to wash the man's feet who is ultimately going to betray you, to continue to serve alongside of him year after year after year. Watching that happen and continuing to serve and love him just as the others. That to me is a challenge. That, to me, is something that is so hard. When you know that there might be something on the fringe that is going on with somebody that's near and dear to you, and they just don't have a heart towards you at all, for you to say, you know what? I'm going to wash your feet anyways. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you, <laughs> my enemy, as I would love myself. That I continue to go down that path. We see Jesus do that, and ultimately Judas crossed the line, which he wasn't able to come back from, paid an ultimate price for it, and now they have to make a decision. But he's using the scripture as a baseline for his decision making. We also see that it's clear that he also wants to be able to do God's will, right? By understanding the scripture, you now can under, start to understand and define what is the will of God. Right, that they would ultimately have a way to have a witness for everything that has happened. So it sees here in verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate, and no one live in it. Okay, that was one psalm. And let another take his office. Okay, so if we're using scripture to start to develop a case for the decision to be made to fill his role and to fill his spot. Verse 21. Therefore, of these men who have accompanied us all the time, that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they, Peter realized there had to be somebody else alongside us. There had to be 12 as it related to these witnesses. Right? What was a witness? Somebody who saw Jesus live Die and resurrected. Not only that, they were thinking, okay, well, how do we make sure this witness is about as reliable of a source as possible? Well, he was there from the very moment Jesus was baptized. So they're looking for guys who have been there from the very beginning, got to see the work of Jesus Christ, may have not been in that inner fold of 12, but was literally faithful for three years alongside of Christ to be able to be drawn in. So as he's making a decision, you kind of see this as um, an ins uh, inspired common sense. right? You wouldn't pick a witness that just happened to see Jesus ascend, and that was it. You've got better measures of common sense to go off. Who's your best eyewitness? 
Is it the little old lady peeking through the window that happens to see the guy that might have been holding a gun sometime in the middle of the night? Right? Or is it the guy standing right next to the guy who gets shot and gets to look him right in the face and say, yeah, I know who that was. So they're, pick, they're using common sense, but it's been inspired by all the previous steps. All of those have come together for them to now make a decision as to who they would decide. Verse 23. And they proposed to, we see Joseph called Barsabbas, who is surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed, and they said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take part in the ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place, and they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and was numbered with the eleven apostles. Okay. They prayed a second time to make sure they're getting this right. But then they cast lots. They roll the dice. That's really what casting lots would have meant, is that you kind of roll the dice or you flip the coin. Right? It's Matthias, you know, tails. We've got... Um, uh, Joseph, right? Flip the coin. Who are you going to get? Next thing you know, it lands on Matthias, and you're the next apostle. <laughs> we don't see doing it that route through the rest of Scripture. Um, so I'm not suggesting that it's like, okay, um, put your garage off and go look for a new one, or stick it out. Flip the coin. <laughs> okay? That's not the suggestion. That's not the understanding. But here's what's important about this. And you've got to understand this. As crazy as that part of casting lots might be. Were they wrong? Were they wrong? Would we consider their decision to be wrong? Decision to cast lots, made a decision to even pick a new apostle. Because we know that Paul was chosen by God Himself to be an apostle. Right? That He says, I was a man born out of my time. Right? Knowing that He was after the fact. And God appointed Paul. And so what we see is for centuries, literally, and there's still this debate today. Did they just do this in their flesh? Did they just make a big, giant mistake? Do you see Matthias anywhere else in the New Testament? You don't. Do you know who else you don't see in the New Testament? After this point? You don't see Andrew? You don't see Thomas? You don't see Bartholomew? Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas the son of James. Do you know you don't see those guys either? You don't get a glimpse into them? You actually see Peter and John, and then you get James, the disciple who was martyred. Those are the three. You don't see the other ones. Did Jesus make a mistake on them? Okay. Well, of course he did. Here's what happens. And I promise you, it'll happen to you. You'll have a desire to obey the Lord. You'll be unified in a decision that you might make with people that you're close with or in your own family. You'll seek the scriptures. You look for wisdom and direction outside of just what the world might bring. You'll have a clear desire to do God's will. Your heart's clean and clear. You're going to be able to use some legitimate common sense between what that decision might look like. And then you make a decision. 
and the one thing that is critiqued isn't the, isn't the previous seven steps of having a heart to discover God's will, but rather is, well, who was that? Was that really God or was that really man? I'll tell you this, what I do know, that's more effort into attempting to discern God's will than most of us will ever end up doing on a whim. When we have a decision before us, what typically guides those decisions? Oftentimes it's our circumstances. What's a better route? Desire God's will, seek his scripture, be unified in your home, be unified amongst those who you may be at work with, or all those sorts of things, and then make a decision. Maybe a little bit different than what people might expect, but you make a decision. Or you look at the circumstances, forget to, to, to jump into the counsel of God's word, forget about the whole prayer thing, make a decision that looks right. That tends to be our pattern in our natural man. And that's not how we're called to make decisions. Was it a mistake? Should they have not have rolled the dice? Should they have waited until God spoke from heaven or just let that spot be open? We can never play Monday morning quarterback. Especially when we see men of God Seeking the heart of God to be able to do the will of God. We can never play that game. And for us and for you, if you have a decision before you that you know you have to make, you've got a little bit of a checklist. You want to make the right one, don't you? I know I do. I remember I went to Dubai. You guys have heard the story. I sought the Lord. My wife and I, we were in unity. We prayed and I even fasted. I was It was crystal clear that I would go to Dubai, even if it's for just one person. Okay? Just one person, I'm going to go to Dubai. And then all of us, I mean, you see the scripture, you can find reason, and you use common sense. There's some things that go around that says, this is making sense to us. It may not make sense to the rest of the world, but it makes sense to us. People thought we were crazy. What a risk you're taking. And you make that step and you make that journey. And next thing you know, like you're, you're thinking eating the dust of the desert, man. It is exhausting. It's tired. And all you can do is question the decision to go to go in that direction. Have you yourself made a mistake in direction? Well, if you were seeking the Lord beforehand, and as I look back, it felt like I made the biggest mistake for my family I could have ever imagined. In the midst of that desperation and the midst of the depression and all of the things that Jessica and I went through, you would say, I had choice. Mistake. Can we take a step back? Was that a mistake? Not a chance. No way. So if you've got a decision to make, follow the pattern that's set here. Frankly, if you're going to do seven of the things and you make some, you know, kind of off-the-cuff call like, God, pick A or B. I mean, maybe they should have thrown in C, like sit tight for Paul. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> the guy who's going to try to get us killed here shortly. Right? I mean, A, B, or C. Which door is it behind? Did they miss the mark? I'll tell you. If you're seeking the Lord, if you've got a heart for his will, if you're praying if you're unified in your home and you're seeking that with all of your heart, and you just and then you move forward and make a decision based on the desires that have been built up in you as you sought the Lord, don't second guess it. Even if somebody else does, 
even if it looks like a ginormous mistake, don't second guess the process. God's taking you through things. God's teaching us how to learn, how to grow with him, how to be a part of that. I'm so thankful for that horrible, no good year of my life. I'm so thankful. Sign me up again, Lord. <laughs> but I'm thankful for it. And it wasn't a mistake. And I think that's a reminder for some of you. You made decisions where you sought the Lord and it feels like now it's a mistake. If you were seeking the Lord and your heart was aligned with his heart as you made a decision, don't chalk it up as a mistake. Don't chalk it up as missing God's will. Learn from it. Grow from it. Let him change you through it. Those decisions are such big things for us. And there's a right way to do it. And you know what? If you see somebody else around you, and you look at them and you say, wow, that was a bonehead decision. I don't know why he did that. Or she did that. When I know that they followed the Lord. Like I know the guy or gal reads the scripture all the time. And he's in it. And he's, he, every time I talk to him he seems to desire God's will. And then he makes that stupid decision. Wait a second. Who are you to sit there and judge somebody who you have seen a lifetime or a season of seeking the Lord? Right? That's the blessing that we actually have so much freedom, especially as other people make decisions, we don't have to jump in judgment. I can't tell you if this was right or wrong. Frankly, does it matter? Some people want to hang their hat on stuff like this. What I see is a process of attempting to discern God's will. Whether you like the decision making at the very end or not, I don't really care. You know, they used to have this thing called an human and a human. They would pull out of their pocket to be able to discern the will of God, which was almost just like casting lots. All right, there's actually a proverb that talks about casting of the lots and God providing direction. I'm not telling you to flip a coin. Seek the will of God as you go to make decisions. And see what he has for you. And as I pray, um, and we're going we're to enter into some, some prayers specifically for the church and for us as a body. Um, as I'm praying, you be thinking of maybe there's a decision that's heavy on you that you've got to have some direction. Um, allow us as a body to pray for you so that you might be able to be granted unity.